Welcome to the newest episode of Beaten and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. In today's video, we're taking a look back at the wild weekend at Talladega, including the crazy finish to the Xfinity Series race, plus yesterday's cup action and everything that came with it, including a first at the Super Speedway since the start of stage racing, a new record in the Gen 7 car, an unhappy Kyle Busch, some interesting comments from Corey LaJoy after he slid across the finish line on his side, his airness seeing his 2311 racing team win for the first time in person, and commercials. Lots and lots of commercials. However, before we get to the commercial 500, let's go back to Saturday's Xfinity Series race, and specifically that finish. Everyone knows at Talladega anything and everything can happen in the closing laps. And that's what we got on Saturday, when Austin Hill, surprise, surprise, found himself up front leading at the super speedway. However, with two laps to go, the number 21 got loose and got a nudge from Parker Kligerman that sent the Richard Childress racing car sideways, which started a chain reaction that took out multiple cars and more importantly, sent the race into overtime. After the first overtime restart where the leaders once again wrecked, we went to overtime number two. And as expected, there were plenty of newcomers up front, including Leland Honeyman, Joey Gaze, Brendan Poole, Cesar Baccarella, and rookie Haley Deegan. The 22-year-old AM racing driver started on the outside of the second row. On that first trip around the 2.66-mile track, the number 98 of Riley Herps, which started on the inside of row 5, moved forward and got in position behind one of the few remaining Fords left in the field driven by Deegan. Ryan Blaney, who was in the broadcast booth, noted the possible pairing of the blue ovals. As the cars crossed the start-finish line to take the white flag, the number 15 ran fifth, but was the first car on the outside lane with the number 98 right behind. Moments later, Herbst moved up to the top of the track, making it three wide with Deegan in the middle. Over the next couple of miles, the Stuart Haas racing driver continued marching forward and impressively finished second while Deegan slipped back and finished 12th, her career best result in Xfinity. Despite her achievement, she and her team weren't happy with Herb's move. Uh, he wasn't, he, he wasn't ever gonna stay with us. That's, that's his MO. P12, good job all day. Are you kidding me, 12? I can't believe the 98 did that. I can't. He does it every time. He does it every time. It don't matter who it is. He does it to everybody. Every time, he will not help anybody out. He's all about himself. I can honestly see both sides. Sure, Deegan has a right to be upset because she felt Herb's did her dirty. However, that being said, I can also see Herb's perspective, and it's honestly hard to argue with his final result. He didn't win, but finished second. There are those who will argue that he could have won if he had connected with Deegan, but that's just too much of a hypothetical for me. A lot can happen in that final lap, and he obviously didn't feel like that was the right move. Again, it's hard to argue with the final result. If I'm Deegan's team, I'm building off her career best finish and moving forward, knowing that in the future, Herbst isn't someone she can trust. Which is interesting when you think about it, because it was two Fords not working together and it proved to be costly to one of them. Something similar happened on Sunday. Speaking of Sunday, let's jump forward to the pre-race show. Before I talk about that, I need to rewind back to last week at Texas. Every race I attend, I have a list of questions that I want to try and get at least one or two questions answered by as many drivers as I can during their media availabilities. Unfortunately, Last week, I didn't get a chance to ask Bubba Wallace the question I wanted to because I was doing my interview with Chris Buescher at his hauler. When I arrived in the media center, Bubba was wrapping up. Thankfully, Kevin Harvick and I are on the same page, and he asked Wallace my question before the race at Talladega, asking what's the difference in the number 23 team and how they've improved their overall performance in the last year and how it's carried over into 2024. Uh, Self-reflection. I think that goes back to when MJ jumped on one of our debrief calls midway through the season, and he says, hey, I hear a lot of blaming others. 
starts with looking in the mirror. And so I think our whole team has done that. And uh, we still re recognize our flaws, and those happen time to time, but it's been a lot less of that. MJ leading the team. A little foreshadowing here. Now, let's move on to the race. Actually, let's move on to Fox's coverage, and specifically, the commercials. I haven't said anything in quite a while about Fox's coverage. It's not because it's been without flaws. I just feel like I'm beating a dead horse. It's established Fox's production is just bad. And that includes their bombarding fans at home with commercials. I get that they like to front load the broadcast with commercials, but Sunday's race at Talladega was next level awful. Why do I believe this? Let's take a look at the numbers from that first stage alone. From the waving of the green flag to the caution to end the first stage, which went caution free, it was a total time of 52 minutes and 13 seconds. During that time, fans watching at home set through a total of six commercial breaks with a couple of them side-by-sides for a grand total of 17 minutes worth of commercials, or 32.6% of the time was watching ads. Think about that. One out of every three minutes was watching a commercial. I know the Athletics' Jeff Gluck mentioned it on his X account, and I was thinking the same thing. NASCAR has all this momentum this season from the Netflix docuseries, and the ratings have reflected that. So when you get to one of your biggest races and Fox and NASCAR promote it like crazy to tune in, and when those fans do tune in and they are subjected to that many commercials early on, I wouldn't blame them if they said, screw it, I'm not going to watch this many ads and changed the channel or went and did something else. It's incredibly frustrating as someone who covers this sport to know that the on-track product is really good, with some exceptions. But the Fox broadcast just doesn't do it justice from a production standpoint, and fans watching at home don't always see that quality product because A, it's completely missed by the Fox cameras because they are zoomed in so close we can see the white in the driver's eyes, or B, it's like it was on Sunday, and we're in a commercial. Rant over. Now back to the race. And I think I was focused on the commercials for a couple of reasons. One, I was at Texas last week, and in the media center, there are no commercials. You get the live feed. And two, those first two stages set a mark at Talladega in the stage racing era, as they both went caution free. The teams were all in fuel saving mode in those first two stages, and there was very little action as drivers were running lap times four seconds slower than their fastest times. Yes, there was some passing, but it was the result of cars not running full throttle. It was crazy to see the throttle traces, and the guys up front are running 100%, and right behind them, they're running around 50%. It was interesting at one point in the second stage when Brad Kozlowski decided to push the pace in order to prevent those guys at the back from saving enough fuel to make it to the end of the stage. That's also when, according to Lee Spencer on Sirius XM NASCAR Radio's post-race show, the RFK Racing driver co-owner recorded the fastest speed in the Gen 7 car at 197.362 miles per hour. Also of note in those first couple of stages were the drivers who were willing to go up front and not worry about gas, including BJ McLeod, Shane Van Gisbergen, and Anthony Alfredo. It was in that final stage where business picked up, and by business, I mean the first caution for cause. And guess what? Fox missed it because we were all watching this. Speaking of Toyotas, as teams started getting close to the point where they could reach their fuel window to make it to the end of the race, the debate was who was going to pit first. Toyotas made the call, pitted, and it appeared to be a good strategy call as they all came out, picked up momentum, and appeared to be in a position to move to the front when the pit cycle was complete. Then it went all wrong and scary wrong, with Eric Jones getting the worst of it and violently slamming hard into the outside wall. Thankfully, he was evaluated and released twice, first from the Enfield Care Center and then later at a local hospital before he returned home to Charlotte later in the evening. While half of the Toyotas were out of the race, the early strategy play appeared to work, as Reddick, Martin Truex Jr., and Ty Gibbs found themselves up front as the laps dwindled, battling against the Fords and Michael McDowell and Brad Keselowski. 
who were desperately trying to get the blue ovals in the win column for the first time in 2024. By the way, it was the first time since 2010 that Ford hadn't won in the first nine races. With seven laps to go, a third lane on the outside started to form. A couple of laps later, with SVG leading the way, it pulled up to within the first three rows of the bottom two lanes. With three laps to go, Kyle Busch slid up in front of the number 16, and a second later, Ty Gibbs did the same. However, the number 54's move was late, and everyone behind had to lift, which stacked up the line and effectively ended any chances of those running in it. Kyle Busch was not happy about it. The world does that happen every time. The two-time champion also had some harsh words after the race. Just a reminder, he didn't hate the cars a year ago when he won. You've all seen the highlights by now of the finish, with Michael McDowell blocking Keselowski and the moves taking away enough momentum of the Fords, including an SHR Ford driven by Noah Gregson, who was pushing the number six from the third position, to allow the number 45 of Reddick to come through the parted sea and steal the victory. Of course, there was an ugly crash which ended with Corey LaJoy sliding across the finish line on his side, before eventually rolling onto his lid and thankfully landing on all fours. After the race, McDowell accepted responsibility for making a late block that extended Ford's painful winless streak across all three national series in 2024. What's interesting to me is to think how Ford had it in the bag, but not working together cost them. Kind of like what happened the day before in the Xfinity Series race with Deegan and Herbst. Plus, when you factor in how well the Toyotas did work together, especially after the crash that took out half their cars, and it makes what happened in the end to the Blue Ovals even more painful. Speaking of pain, Corey LaJoy was interviewed after the race and talked about his incident. Take a listen. Made a wrong move um, with about 25 to go. Tried covering the top. Top went backwards. Kind of knew that was going to happen, but me and the spotter got in a little bit of argument, but uh, put us in a bad spot. We were just trying to chip our way back to the front, and then, uh, as you would anticipate, the guys started wrecking, and you don't really see much. And I thought that I was actually uh, kind of getting cleared. I was behind by the 38. I uh, saw him kind of wounded, but I kind of aimed for him because I felt that was my best chance to get through it and then got hit in the left rear. Uh, and the next thing I know, my left side door was on the ground and a lot of sparks. And then flipped over on the roof and then flipped over on the flat and slipped past the start finish line. I found it surprising and interesting that he felt it necessary to bring up his disagreement with his spotter. But in the end, and most importantly, he was able to do an interview just like Eric Jones. That speaks to the safety of these cars. Jones took a vicious hit. LaJoy was on his side. I know the Gen 7 car was criticized early on for its safety record, and justifiably so, with multiple concussions and cutting Kurt Busch's career short. But Sunday's race proved the durability and protection the drivers have in these cars, and we can never lose sight of that. Oh yeah, and the fact that they're modern-day gladiators who are willing to put life and limb on the line every time that they strap in a car. Badasses. And let's end on a lighter note, and it came in the post-race interview with Michael Jordan. First of all, having the GOAT present at races is freaking awesome. I saw him last month at Coda, but to have him at Talladega and in victory lane is a massive win for the sport. To see him holding Reddick's son Bo in his arms was a moment that will live on forever. Can you imagine Bo in 10 years talking about that moment to his friends? So cool. But I think my favorite moment during MJ's interview with Fox's Jamie Little was one of the first things he said about being there and his fellow co-owner, Denny Hamlin. Well, Denny keeps saying I was bad luck when I come to the track. Um, and today we proved him wrong. I mean, look. Actually, he did a good job by wrecking so we can get up front. That was, that was actually pretty good. But Gotta love him taking a little swipe at his friend and business partner. Hamlin talked later in his post-race interview with SiriusXM about the win, Jordan being there, and what his plans are for the number 45 car. Things just lined up perfectly today. With Michael being here, him, you know, that special paint scheme that I, you know, 
was grossly envy of this this entire week of him getting the run and then him putting it in a victory lane it just it looks so good i'm trying to figure out now how i can get that car in the lobby and not mess with it a great day for 2311 racing not so much for ford or as they say just racing all right guys that'll do it for this episode i want to know your thoughts first on what happened in saturday's xfinity series race between Haley deegan and riley herbst who do you side with and on Sunday, let's start with the commercials. I think I know your thoughts, but I still want to hear them. And what do you think about the first two stages going caution-free? Pretty bizarre if you ask me. And what did you think about the fuel-saving strategy? I know it's not ideal, but I thought what happened in that final stage when the Toyotas pitted early and forced the issue was compelling. It made you wonder if they were going to be fast enough to stay ahead of that main pack. And finally. What did you think of MJ being in victory lane for the first time and what he had to say? Remember, if you want to read my written work, go check it out at heavy.com and beatingandbanging.com, where you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter and you'll receive an email each Friday recapping the top stories from the week, including reviews of the various NASCAR-related podcasts. Thanks as always for supporting the channel and I hope you have a great rest of your day.